you know, maybe understand even the least of the uh, of the you know contribution of the large body of contribution that Alex made. But I guess what inspired me most um, throughout the years is really a breadth of Alex's work. And you know, one thing in particular which I find truly inspiring and which I actually try to tell my students now is that you know here is a, a man who is uh, you know way after his you know 50s or 60s or 70s birthday you know just goes in new areas and starts new research directions and uh, these directions are then followed by many and inspire you know some new ideas and inspire new experiments so I really I really find it amazing and you know I kind of wish that you know I can do this as well and you know many of the young people could do this as well. So, um, it, you know, so like I'm kind of, you know, a little bit, you know, hesitating here due to Kate's comment about this, you know, telling things from the past, you know, like, so my association with the item was not as long as for many other people, but kind of in the spirit of this, you know, breadth of the item, maybe I would like to, to just tell a very brief story about my first contact with item scientists, and uh, the, the uh, and what so what happened was that I was finishing my PhD at Texas A&M, and I was told by a few people to apply for item postdoctoral fellowship. And I frankly thought I don't really have much chance, and I nevertheless thought maybe I should call up some people at, at the item. So I looked at the item website and. And actually, I looked at what people are doing, and I really did not see anything which would sort of match, you know, my expertise at that time. And um, I was naturally worried about that, so basically I thought that, well, look, you know, this is, you know, not a right place for me. But then I still thought that, you know, I should, you know, maybe just to make sure call, you know, the, you know, kind of item uh, directors, and I guess I first tried to call Alex and somehow he was not around and I tried to call Rick and he wasn't around and it was already past deadline so I was a little bit kind of you know, nervous. Um, but I mean then there was uh, a, a, uh, on the website there was a you know, picture of what you know, I thought a young lady you know, and who was a deputy director of, of, the, of the item. And I immediately looked at it and I thought well maybe this you know, young lady is you know, Alex's or, or, or Rick's postdoc that you know, at least I have a chance to talk with someone in person. So I called up the, this person so it, and, and I you know, had what I thought was a pleasant conversation with her. But basically what I, I, I asked her is, you know, I explained my situation and I asked whether I should really apply for, to the item given that you know, people are not really working on the kinds of things in which I have any kind of background. Uh, and basically my question was that whether I could reach someone like you know, Rick or Alex, you know, someone who really is involved in making a decision. And then you know, this nice girl you know, tried to explain that he is also one of the people who, who is trying to make a decision. And that was kind of our conversation. You know, it went on for some time. So uh, evidently you know, uh, after this um, uh, conversation uh, was, was over, uh, 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 the person on the other end of the line, who turned out to be Kate, you know, went out of your office and, you know, who started talking with the other uh, uh, item postdocs, and her reaction was that, uh, that, that this was the most arrogant person that she ever spoke up <laughs> with, because he, he didn't want to believe that I could be involved in making, you know, the item, you know, these decisions about item postdocs. But nevertheless, they somehow, you know, they, they, uh, it turned out that, you know, at the end, um, uh, I guess it's thanks to the vision of, of the item founders that actually I was selected as, as item postdoc, despite of the fact that at that time, as I say, my, inter my experience, expertise was really totally in the opposite direction, which already at the time uh, was pretty amazing to me. And so, this was actually kind of a start of my association with the item, and what I'd like to do now is to um, kind of jump now, like, I don't know, 10 years, you know, fast forward in time, and, you know, uh, tell a little bit kind of in the spirit of this, you know, uh, of this kind of broadly defined uh, kind of AMO physics, you know, uh, talk a little bit about what other research directions which 
are explored by item scientists, but also that are explored by, you know, AMO physicists around the world. And I should say that, I guess, on the last, over the last decade or so, we have seen basically a new era which, uh, 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 which started in AMO physics. And there are many manifestations of this, perhaps what I will just talk about one specific, you know, uh, um, uh, area which really, you know, I guess exemplifies this new area. And this is a fascinating developments involving the interfaces between kind of traditional disciplines in physical scientists. And, uh, and these disciplines include atomic physics and optics on one hand, but they also include things like condensed matter physics, nanoscience, particle physics, and quantum information science. So basically, what uh, co the common thing which really binds these things together is a quest for controlled manipulation of quantum mechanical phenomena, the search for uh, new quantum states of matter, and, and also exploration of potential applications of such uh, controlled uh, quantum systems. So uh, I guess it's quite late. I mean, I had sort of few examples which I wanted to highlight. So. One of them is the area of ultra-cold atoms. And many people, you know, have spoken about this already and will speak more at this symposium. But one specific avenue which I'd like to highlight is that ultra-cold atoms are now being used for understanding ma complex many-body condensed matter systems. And basically, the motivation for that is uh, very simple. The motivation is that modern materials uh, uh, many of them are uh, strongly correlated quantum materials. So examples, for example, are cuprates, high temperature materials, complex magnetic materials, and basically the fact that they are built from complex uh, kind of building blocks which then behave quantum mechanically makes it very difficult to understand them starting from the first principles. In fact, even if you can write some models which could potentially describe these materials, it turns out that it's extremely difficult to do any calculations with these models. So these models involve basically many body strongly correlated quantum mechanical systems and you know this is essentially impossible to simulate them using for example conventional computers or for that matter using theoretical tools. And so what happened was that over the last few years a new approach has emerged to understand such a systems, and this approach essentially makes use the systems of uh, composed from ultra-cold atoms uh, for which we know very well the interactions and we know how to control them. So basically this approach is essentially to try to create an analogous systems and try to do experiments in the spirit of what's called quantum uh, simulators. Basically trying to do to implement the complex Hamiltonians in the lab and try to, you know, look for new physics and try to look for manifestations new, with new physics with the hope of really understanding uh, um, uh, un understanding uh, the real complex materials. So if this, this is a very ambitious program, but if this can be achieved, then there is a hope that perhaps with the better understanding of these new materials, one could then try to kind of custom make, uh, you know, discover new materials, not by just, you know, trial and error method, but, you know, do it more systematically. Needless to say, understanding atomic properties, understanding how atoms interact at low energy is absolute key to this. So without the work which Alex, you know, has started many years ago, we wouldn't be in a position to do this. One other area which is uh, emerging as an extremely exciting area is the area involving ultra-cold polar molecules. In this area, Alex also has basically started, uh, uh, has done a pioneering work looking at collisions of these molecules, looking at interactions of these molecules and things like this. So right now, there are several uh, big promises, with sort of promises of big science which uh, people are exploring, and some of them include the many body physics, the fact that polar molecules can interact at a long range, adds additional dimension to these quantum simulators. But also, 
uh, people believe that some very interesting few body physics might occur already having few of these molecules. And for example, one could look at you know, applications such as novel quantum bits for quantum information science. But much beyond that, pol uh, cold polar molecules have been identified as very promising systems for looking uh, at the physics beyond standard model. For example, by doing precision symmetry tests or, uh, with uh, such systems, uh, there is a hope that one could you know, obtain some much larger, for example, you know, violations in the search of you know, uh, permanent dipole moments and you know, all sorts of signatures which would really uh, cross the boundary you know, of the standard model. Just to put it in contrast, you know, there is much, very, you know, much talk now about LHC, which is just starting now. So here is a system which might have as much chances to get in, insight into the relevant physics as this huge you know, and complex machine, which is now being you know, started in Geneva. Of course, these are totally different things, but you know, just to give you some perspective. On Finally, of course, you know, uh, the intriguing province of these ultra-cold molecules is to really try to look at the molecular dynamics, at, at the chemical reactions under a totally different regime, and the regime where you can really control the all ingredients of these chemical reactions. And this really would be a totally new area, uh, era in chemistry. One last uh, kind of scientific highlight which I would like to bring up is another very exciting field, which is an interface between IMO physics and nanoscience. So many of you have probably seen view graphs like this, which basically says that the size of the electronic devices now has been you know, scaled from kind of gigantic machines to uh, down to you know, few electrons, now down to single electron. As a matter of fact, now experimentalists around the world can build circuits based on manipulation of single nuclei. So to what extent can one really you know, realize the potential of you know, such miniaturized devices is by now not clear. And as a matter of fact, in some fields, for example, in nuclear magnetic resonant imaging, uh, the quest for controlling single nuclei has been a holy grail for many, many years. So it is known that if you could look at single nuclei one at a time, then one could essentially do MRI on single molecules. One could do what you know, people, you know, what, what you do by going to the hospital now at the level of individual atoms and molecules. It is a big challenge to really be able to look at a single nuclei because you know, simply you know, the nuclei really interact with everything else around it or only why the tiny magnetic fields uh, uh, they produce, but actually there are now several approaches uh, that um, people around the world are being uh, are using to uh, to uh, approach this limit. And I guess uh, earlier on today, one of ITAMP alumni, Jake Taylor, talked about some work that we are doing here, which essentially use the um, property of some individual atoms, individual impurity in atoms in diamond as a nanoscale magnetic sensor. Needless to say that you know, all of this machinery of AMO physics, which you know, has been developed to try to really look at single uh, atoms to understand the properties of single atoms, has now has to be applied now in the context of these more and more complex systems. But actually, you know, it turns out that you know, it is really possible to understand and control this kind of artificial atoms to the point that they can really be used as a uh, you know, extraordinary sensors, for example, of magnetic field. And in fact, uh, you know, in my group and in some other groups around the world, we have already been able to address and control individual nuclei, for example, in diamond lattice. One last point that I'd like to make here is that Cambridge now is truly a unique place for doing the kind of science that I just described. So, and you know, in many respects, it, it really is due to few people who uh, put their name and their energy in kind of putting together and gluing together the unique community of theorists and experimentalists uh, who are able to interact with each other and uh, work together. And you know, this also creates a unique environment which is followed by students 
uh, and, 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 and younger researchers. It's not perhaps surprising that you know, Cambridge really does host two uh, uh, premier research centers. One of them is an institute uh, for theoretical atomic and molecular physics, and another one is Center for Ultra Cold Atoms. So Rick already has pointed out that uh, Alex has not only been a founder of the item, but he also played a very important role in uh, uh, starting out the Center for Ultra Cold Atoms. And together, these uh, two centers really basically you know, define what atomic physics is uh, today in the United States and in, uh, uh, in the world, I would say. So in a sense, it's easy to uh, kind of start exploring this new area and you know, going into a new direction when you have people like Alex. And I would like to just thank him for all of the things that he has done for all of us.